Good afternoon. We're going to wait just a uh, a few seconds for uh, people to be able to uh, to join in. So if everyone can uh, just be uh, patient for just uh, a minute or so, and then uh, I'll get the uh, high sign that we can uh, we can begin. But uh, really grateful everybody has uh, joined us, and particularly grateful for all the uh, people on our panel, and of course my colleagues in uh, in Congress for joining us this morning. And you can, Joe, you can tell me when we get to a critical mass here. Yeah, we're at 167. Okay, good. I feel like I should be able to juggle or something in the, uh, keep people's attention, but unfortunately I don't have any skills in that regard. Um, but I am happy to see spring has come to Washington. Not so much in Rochester, New York, where I'm from, but, uh, but it's definitely springtime here. Good. So I think we have uh, enough people in the uh, in the space. So we're going to uh, begin. So good afternoon, and thank you all for tuning in today for what we hope is the first of many conversations about the optics and photonics industry. And I am thrilled to be joined by some incredibly talented individuals who are not only well versed in optics and photonics, but share the common goal of ensuring our nation remains a global leader in light based technology innovation. Uh, the bipartisan bicameral caucus we are announcing today is a result of a multi-year effort and I'm so grateful to my colleagues, industry experts and local advocates who helped make this a reality. As a congressional caucus, we will work in a bipartisan manner to increase awareness of how optics and photonics improves the everyday lives of Americans and work to maintain the United States position as a leader in global innovation. My hometown of Rochester, New York has deep connections to the optics and photonics industry, and I'm proud of the far-reaching benefits and opportunities the industry has afforded our region. In my community alone, there are thousands of workers across dozens of companies developing cutting-edge, state-of-the-art products. In fact, a lens designed by a company in my region just landed on Mars as part of the Perseverance rover. We're very, very excited, and congratulations to all the folks that worked on this project. But the applications of this technology go far beyond space travel. They benefit Americans every single day. Light-based innovation is already improving the way we communicate, energizing our grids, helping how we administer healthcare in our country, and even enhancing our national security. This industry has been a foundation for success in the past and quite literally lights the way for our future. Our world is shifting to a knowledge-based economy that rewards those nations who invest in innovation and are at the forefront of emerging technologies. And the reward for what our nation needs most right now, a boost in our economy and the creation of stable, high paying jobs. So promoting optics and photonics is so much more than holding up the cutting edge products as a business makes. It's also about the hope and opportunity the industry inspires in our students and workers. When I came to Congress just a couple of years ago, I knew that my community was not the only optics and photonics hub in the nation but I was surprised by the general lack of knowledge or siloed knowledge of the capabilities of light-based technologies. And that's why we're here today. My colleagues in the House and Senate share the knowledge of what this industry can offer. And so we have come together to educate our colleagues, create opportunities to connect with constituents and policy experts, and to collaborate to ensure the United States remains a leader in optics and photonics for light years to come. And with that, I am pleased to introduce uh, our next speaker, a fellow member of the House, the, uh, my fellow House co-chair, someone who has devoted his life to the service of our country, Congressman Brian Matz of Florida's 18th Congressional District. Congressman? Hey, thanks for that warm handoff. And, uh, you know, thank you, everybody, uh, for letting me be a part of this. Congressman Brian Matz here. Um, so for everybody involved in putting together today's Optics and Photonics Caucus launch event. Um, this is something that, that Representative Morelli and myself, uh, we've been working on this for months here in the House, uh, you know, really beyond that. And, and I couldn't be more excited to join you all virtually for today's launch. And the excitement comes from this. 
there is sexy science out there and this is sexy science this is something that that excites people that you know you think uh, uh, of the various industries out there and the places that people want to go to work it's because of the innovation that they see going on in various places that say you know i want to pursue uh you know stem i want to get wise in this i want to get a degree in that and i want to go out there and i want to develop these things we've all heard you know emotion creates emotion well innovation creates more innovation there's no doubt in my mind that the optics and the photonics industry it's proving to play a, a more critical role in our nation's economy with its technology spanning a number of different sectors. And we can look at, at what's going on right in our own backyards, the energy industry, solar, uh, moving, moving photons in, in our phones instead of moving electrons through our, through our iPhones or Android, whatever it is that you choose to use. Uh, you know, people that are flying jumbo jets out there and being able to have them them operate in in a partially automated fashion because of the technology that's on those or in the the cameras that are in our our vehicles that allow allow us to look in different directions or allow our vehicles to move more safely uh, within one another without our, our active use of a steering wheel to do these things, virtual and augmented reality. And, and the list can go on and on of, of, like I said, what I'd call some some pretty sexy science out there that excites people to get involved with. In, in my own community, my own backyard, um, South Florida, we have uh, Indian River State College that was really the impetus for me getting involved in the optics and photonics caucus and starting to look in this because of what they're doing at that school and looking to advance high paying jobs and looking to prepare workers for the future, a future in this type of industry with, with great partnerships with colleges like that and with industry. And that's why I believe it's so important for Congress to support the optics and photonics industry and, and invest in the growth of this industry, it ultimately means expanding our nation's manufacturing output, improving our national security, all of these things that my colleague has spoken about, enhancing what we do with medical technology, our computing capabilities, that is what we can do with our advancement in this. So I, I think we can all agree more than ever, um, we need new discovery, we need new innovation, and we know that it's just over the, the, the horizon for us. It's, it's just over a bit of study, a bit of research, a bit of looking into it and the possibilities that, that come with using what we see here. It, it's exciting to me. And I know it's exciting to a lot of others as well. So as the co-chair of this caucus, I just want to say that I couldn't be to be more excited um, to help pave the way for America to be a leader in this field. Let's get to work. I'm still searching around for the mute button after all this time. You know, you think you'd get used to it, but I uh, I do want to uh, thank uh, Congressman Mass not only for his leadership, but you can see the passion that he brings to this. And, you know, so many of us here in Washington are looking for opportunities where we can find common ground. And I certainly think uh, this work together, which I'm really looking forward to, is a place where we'll really find common ground about m moving forward uh, and having a sense of national purpose around innovation. So thanks for uh, your leadership and for being here. Uh, senior Senator from Arizona, Senator Cinema, unfortunately had a last minute unavoidable conflict and so she's unable to join us this morning, but she sends her best and passed along that um, she is thrilled uh, to, uh, to uh, participate in this bipartisan effort and, uh, and bring folks together around this innovation. Obviously, she is um, someone in a state that uh, is doing a lot of great work here and she's uh, obviously interested in boosting Arizona's economy by helping Arizona universities and businesses continue uh, innovation in this space. So I um, understand that uh, Senator Daines is uh, going to be joining us in a short while. So uh, I'll come back to uh, introducing him. But uh, for now, let me uh, go to our other panelists. I'd like to introduce Dr. Bruce uh, Tromberg, who is a leading researcher in the field of biophotonics and the director of the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, uh, which is a mouthful, NIBIB uh, within the National uh, Institute of Health. He is currently helping to lead the Institute's $500 million rapid acceleration of diagnostics innovation initiative to increase testing capacity and performance for the COVID 
19 pandemic. Doctor, I can't uh, thank you enough for being here. And uh, with that, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Congressman Morelli, and uh, co-chairs, Congressman Mast, Senators Cinema and Danes, and my colleagues on the panel. Um, it's truly an honor to participate in the Optics and Photonics Caucus today. Um, as Congressman Morelli said, I'm the director of the National Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, or NIBIB, at the NIH. Uh, we're the only NIH institute dedicated exclusively to the development, commercialization, and clinical translation of engineering, physical science, and computational technologies in biology and medicine. NIBIB was established by an act of Congress 20 years ago, and since then, our bioengineering community has grown enormously in size and impact. Importantly, when you look at many of the innovations we support, what you'll find under the hood are advanced optics and photonics technologies powering cutting-edge methods, discoveries, and devices in biology and medicine. This is the field of biophotonics, a $70 billion per year industry that spans from microscopes to endoscopes, wearable sensors to surgical lasers. Prior to joining NIH in January 2019, I spent about 30 years pioneering the development of biophotonics technologies as a professor of biomedical engineering and surgery and director of the Beckman Laser Institute and Medical Clinic at the University of California, Irvine. Just 13 months after joining NIH, I, like many of you, became intensely focused on the fast-moving COVID-19 crisis and began to work on ways NIBIB could help. We launched a bold new program, RADx, Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics, only five days after NIH received generous support from the fourth congressional supplement. Our audacious goal was to drive an unprecedented expansion of COVID testing technologies from concept to manufacturing, a cycle that normally requires five to six years, and do this within five to six months. I knew that we had game-changing optics and photonics technologies that were ready to jump from research labs to the marketplace, but these methods needed to be combined with molecular assays and undergo intensive de-risking and validation prior to investment. To do that, we built RADx around a Shark Tank-like review process and our national point-of-care technology research network. In just three months, RADx received more than 700 applications from companies and academic groups around the world. Only five months after launch, RADx supported companies were obtaining regulatory approval and moving to market. As of today, we've invested more than $520 million in 27 companies for manufacturing expansion. These organizations produced 94 million new COVID tests just between September and December 2020, and more than 2.5 million tests per day are projected by March 2021. Most of these are accessible technologies for screening and surveillance in point of care and at-home settings. Virtually all of these platforms, both nucleic acid and rapid antigen tests, depend on optics and photonics technologies to reveal the presence of an invisible virus. One example is the first rapid home test to receive FDA over-the-counter EUA clearance. This device, made by Illum, packs in quantum dot reporters, integrated optoelectronics, miniature optics, a solid-state source and detector, and syncs via Bluetooth with a smartphone. This is a brief snapshot of how advances in biophotonics and new partnerships between government, academia, and the private sector are dramatically changing our world. It's exciting to be part of this growing community of innovators working together to achieve our vision, engineering the future of health for all Americans. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to the opportunity to answer questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tromberg. That's, uh... I'm not sure I understood everything you said, but um, clearly fascinating and uh, so grateful for all the work that uh, you're doing. Uh, next, I'm pleased to introduce our honorary co-chair who was the first member to commit to joining me in this endeavor over a year ago, Senator Steve Daines of Montana. Uh, the Senator, as uh, I'm sure you all know, has extensive public and private sector experience. I'm delighted to have his partnership. I understand he ran over from one meeting, so I hope you've had a chance to catch your uh, breath. But uh, with that, uh, let me introduce you, Senator Daines. Hey, thanks, Congressman. Well, it's great. We've officially launched the Optics and Photonics Caucus. I guess it's only fitting 
they were doing this virtually because uh, the thing with your information, the video, the more, and what we're doing here is being beamed directly to you by the innovation that comes from optics and photonics. So as it should be, uh, I really want to thank you, Congressman Morelli, uh, for your leadership, and uh, thank you as well as my fellow co-chair, uh, Senator Cinema, and uh, and then as well as Congressman Mast uh, for joining in leading this joint effort. You know, this growing field of optics and photonics is going to help support and create. Uh, better paying jobs across the country. It's a really important as we think about the innovation ecosystem we're seeing developing around the world in places like China. We've got to be able to go faster to, in order that we can globally compete and continue to win in this really important sector. This is really, I think, in many ways, vital to the future of our economy. This is the cutting edge technology that will improve the lives of the American people uh, and we'll continue to maintain our nation's role as a leader in global, really, tech innovation. And I'll tell you what, you may not think about Montana, maybe it's your number one place for photonics and optics innovation. Let me tell you something, we're leading the charge out there, my hometown of Bozeman, uh, because uh, people love to, to fish and to hunt and to ski. We can attract and retain some of the best talent in the world right there. And we've got a great cluster of companies that are right on the cutting edge. Uh, leading this innovation job. In fact, I'm going to be visiting one of them on Friday when I'm back home in Montana. So uh, bottom line is this, it's going to help us improve our defense capabilities, communications, energy, healthcare, precision, agriculture, manufacturing, transportation. It's a great list. And I'm just honored to be a part of, uh, of helping in any way facilitate, lead and support uh, this critical industry. So look forward to work with you all. Thanks so much. Back to you, Congressman Morelli. Thank you uh, so much, Senator. And I think uh, uh, there's a lot of places around this country that are in, in, involved in innovation and uh, they may not be top of mind in terms of how we think about it, but that's one of the things that uh, we're all gonna work to change is people's perceptions of, of where centers of innovation are and they're all over this country. So I'm grateful for your leadership and for your help with this. I'm now pleased, <clears throat> excuse me, to turn it over to Ms. Adele Radcliffe, who is the Director of Industrial Base Analysis and Sustainment uh, IBAS program within the Department of Defense Office of Industrial Policy and her role as director. She works to enable a modern industrial base that integrates traditional and emerging sectors to respond at will to national security requirements and challenges. And I've had the privilege of working with uh, Ms. Radcliffe on a number of projects, including uh, one near and dear to my heart in Rochester, New York. So uh, with that, um, uh, Director Radcliffe, thank you. Thanks, Congressman. It's good to be here with you today. Uh, thanks a lot for Congressman uh, Mast, your, your sponsorship of the Congress as well and Senators as well. Um, thanks a lot to the National Photonics Initiative for the support of this effort. Um, I always enjoy my time in Rochester getting to know the, uh, the rich history of the optics community and the current industry members. Um, it's that, that time there that's really, it, it, you know, uh, solidified the my interest in understanding the importance of this uh, critical technology. I look forward to uh, uh, our ability to see each other again in person and Congressman Mass to get down to your Indian River area as well. You know, it seems like uh, when precision optics first started in the Department of Defense, it was wedded to kind of boutique status, whether that was, you know, for night vision goggles, for all the night. But as many of you have already noted on the, on the front end of the conversation here, it's broadly proliferated technology now. Uh, it's in every weapon system that we have. Many of those uh, manufacturers sit up there in that Rochester area. It just, and it seems like that the commercial industry has uh, an equally insatiable appetite for the technology as well. Whether it's uh, helping to advance industry 4.0 for our small and medium manufacturers to help them be globally competitive uh, medical devices that allow us to see where uh, we previously were not detectable through otherwise intrusive uh, technologies and, and methods. Uh, the new, um, our cell phone that allows for, uh, you know, uh, facial scanning for my pass codes and also selfie photos when I'm on vacation. Uh, the applications of that, drones and self-driving vehicles, the applications of precision optics in that intersection of photonics for that data uh, movement of that high end of data um, is, is endless opportunities. But for the United States to fully harness the opportunity of the technology, the technology and, re and reap the dividends of the prosperity and the promise of it, 
whether it's to hold the capabilities that we have in Rochester and Indian River and other areas and build back our industrial capabilities and capacities in this key technology and other technologies that we need for national security and economic growth, we've got to have a skilled workforce that is rightly sized. And that workforce has been under attack in manufacturing for decades. And now with a surging focus on manufacturing, we see fierce competition for that labor um, at a time where the career and technical education hasn't been valued. We see a fierce competition for that, for that space. And we've got to begin to address this um, and to respond to that need and begin to catalyze things. Uh, the, the IBAS program that I run uh, within the Department of Defense launched the National Imperative for Industrial Skills. And this was to work with defense communities to begin to regrow our necessary skills for national security. We wanna be able to promote the prestige of those workers coming into this exciting technology front, accelerate them through their development pipelines and elevate them to world-class standards. And to do that, we wanna, in, in doing so, we can now regrow our necessary skills like five axis or precision optics technicians needed for today and tomorrow. Um, I'm excited about the opportunity of our soon to be awarded Precision Optics Consortium. And one of the first efforts we'll take on in that is this key issue of workforce for the technicians related to precision optics. We'll look to expand on the efforts there at Monroe Community College that Alexis I'm sure is gonna talk about next and cascade those to other areas in our country so that our workforce becomes the competitive advantage for the United States in this technology and a global disruptor for us. Um, and so with that, I look forward to working with you, congressmen and senators on this important topic and others in the, in the caucus. And I'll turn it back over to you, Congressman Morelli. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Radcliffe, uh, for your incredible leadership in this space. And we are all looking forward to, uh, to working with you in the years ahead. Uh, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alexis Vogt, who is the Endowed Chair and Professor of Optics at Monroe Community College in my hometown of Rochester, New York. Uh, they are, and she is a leading educator in the field of optics and photonics. And in addition to her work as an educator uh, in this space, uh, she is also focused on growing MCC's optics and photonics program, the only two year degree program uh, training technicians for precision optics industry. So we're delighted to have you and uh, take it away, Dr. Vogt. Thank you, Congressman Morelli and co-chairs, Congressman Mast, Senator Daines and Senator Sinema for your vision in establishing the Optics and Photonics Caucus. And thank you to the National Photonics Initiative for supporting the effort. I'm thrilled there's a forward thinking group focused upon our industry on Capitol Hill. Our industry is responsible for remarkable innovations which improve our lives every day from personal safety with backup cameras and sensors in our cars to defense superiority and national security efforts, to smartphones that soon will only need to be charged once a month. As Congressman Morelli said, I'm the professor and chair of optics at Monroe Community College here in Rochester, New York, where we train precision optics and photonics technicians. But before turning my passion to educating optics technicians, I worked in the optics industry that currently supports one out of 14 households in Monroe County where Rochester is located. Our regional optics cluster is 168 years old and began when Bausch and Lomb began their work at Rochester in 1853. Today, the area is home to more than 120 optics, photonics, and imaging companies of all shapes and sizes. These companies generate over $3 billion in annual sales and provide meaningful employment for 17,000 people. And their products and services are deemed essential to the medical, aerospace, semiconductor, and defense industries. It should come as no surprise that Rochester is also known as the nation's center for optics education. Our region is responsible for having educated half of the optics PhDs currently working across the nation. I'm proud to be one of them. My alma mater, the Institute of Optics at the University of Rochester is the nation's longest standing program for studying optics. Rochester is also home to the Center for Imaging Science and the Future Photon Initiative at the Rochester Institute of Technology and home to Monroe Community College, where for 40 years, we have been the only college in the world awarding associate degrees in precision optics. Over the past five years, MCC's optics program has been supported by $1.7 million from industry partners, 
a $550,000 grant from the National Science Foundation, and most recently, a $4.4 million grant from the Department of Defense Office of Naval Research. The Finger Lakes region of New York State, where MCC resides, has an estimated annual demand for more than 550 optics technicians. Our enrollment increased by 72% in the fall to an all-time high, but that is not enough to fill even our local workforce need, let alone the entire country. Much work remains both regionally and nationally. We look forward to working with the optics and photonics clusters in Arizona, Florida, Montana, and all across the country to share our innovative training programs, including our Precision Optics Apprenticeship Program, and share our best practices for expanded enrollment, retention, and graduation of underrepresented populations, as well as our strong alliances with the Optics Network, pre-collegiate educators, and industry partners. Our industry has well-paying, in-demand jobs that are ensuring technological superiority for the Department of Defense and revolutionizing our world. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Doctor, for your uh, leadership and expertise. Uh, and uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, before we go on to our next uh, item, which is a, uh, a great video uh, that was uh, put together by NIST, but before I do that, I would be remiss, and I'm sure uh, my colleague, Congressman Mast, uh, will join me in thanking our staff who put this together. I, I know that I could not have done any of this without Joe Stiles uh, on my staff, who many of you have interacted with, and she just did a great job. And Libby uh, Tidwell in uh, Congressman Mast's office, I know he would want to uh, join me in thanking them for their uh, um, um, great contributions to uh, to putting this together, and obviously uh, as well for uh, the uh, members of uh, uh, Senator Sinema and Senator Dane's staff. Uh, with that, we are also grateful to the National Institute of Standards and Technology for contributing to this event today uh, with technology demonstrations. In this brief video, Zisman Ahmed, a research chemist with NIST, shares two examples of how photonics is being used today to develop practical and potentially life-saving technology in the fields of health and infrastructure. And with that, let's play the video. Have you ever wondered if it's possible to continuously measure someone's blood pressure or to continuously monitor the health of physical infrastructure in your hometown? Well, thanks to embedded photonics technology, that dream is closer to being a reality than ever before. In the two videos you're going to see, we show you how, using photonics technology, we can measure certain changes in the shape of an object due to mechanical forces. NIST scientists affectionately refer to this machine as the crushinator. Its job is to apply pressure to things in a controlled way. This squishy pad of silicone being tested here is part of a new device that could help doctors monitor their patient's blood pressure. The silicone acts like the soft tissue in your wrist, and the crushinator mimics the pressure of blood pumping through an artery. Thin optical fibers measure subtle changes in the pressure as it goes up and down in real time. Researchers are currently using this work to build a physical model of a human arm, complete with a fake artery running through the silicone. The model arm could then be used to design a new kind of blood pressure monitor that people could wear on their wrists like a watch. In the second example, we are used, distant engineers were interested in alternative ways for them to assess the mechanical properties of, the con of concrete they've created. In these examples, what we are showing is that it's possible using embedded photonics technology to, for engineers to have real-time information that tells them the quality of concrete they're creating and hopefully learn to adjust the recipe they're using to create the product that they desire, hopefully eliminating waste or at least reducing it. And then in the, over the long term, they can use the same sensors to monitor the health of the infrastructure they have created.
just two examples of how we're using photonics to solve real-world problems. At the National Institute of Standards and Technology, we're working on a host of other on-chips photonic technologies that can serve as sensors and standards. Uh, these sensors and standards hopefully will put measurement standards directly into the hands of the users, saving them not only money and time, but hopefully spurring new innovations in both science and manufacturing that will help the U.S. economy grow. Thank you uh, so much. That was fascinating, Zeeshan and uh, the folks at NIST. We uh, so much appreciate that. Um, I do want to uh, now uh, close out our event with uh, Q&A, and I'm pleased to be joined by a dear friend, longtime friend. We've worked together in Rochester, uh, Ed White, who's the chairman of the National Photonics Initiative. Ed is a longtime champion of optics and photonics research and a leader in this field and community. And uh, he even will indulge me occasionally when we're sitting together in the airport on a conversation about quantum physics. Um, so, uh, so he's tried to educate me, although I'm largely ineducable, unfortunately. But uh, thank you to those who submitted questions in advance. And we will start uh, with those, the ones that were uh, submitted, and uh, hopefully get to a couple live questions as well as we have time before the, uh, we uh, finish our time here today. So um, let me uh, begin with a question that we received from Ohio. Um, and the question is, what opportunities are there for significant uh, involvement? And I, this relates to the um, members of, uh, of Congress. And the main goal of the caucus, is, as I said, is to help members better understand the industry, uh, how well established it already is, rather than thinking of it as uh, science fiction or in the future, it's, it's science fact that's happening today. Um, as well as the developments and potential for future success and growth. So constituent engagement with members is critical to growing uh, support and interest. We know that. So uh, all of you who are on uh, this uh, and here, uh, this message and are participating today, the more that you talk to your members of Congress, your members of the United States Senate, and encourage them to, uh, to participate and really get involved with this, that will really help us in our, our goals. And um, a part of the caucus moving forward will be briefings and events for members and their staff, which is critical in these types of events will succeed uh, when experts join the conversation and we'll look to industry for input and for their participation as we host events and briefings. That video is a great example of knowing how we apply photonics and, and optics uh, to the incredible work that's, uh, that's being done and what the future brings. So with that, let me uh, ask the next question of my friend, Ed. Uh, what do you see as the biggest barrier to the growth of optics and photonics technology uh, in, in the United States. Uh, thank you, Congressman Morelli. Uh, and before I answer the question, I just wanted to add my thanks to you and to the co-chairs, um, you know, Congressman Nast, um, Senators uh, Danes and Cinema, um, for sponsoring this caucus and leading and uh, this, this caucus. Uh, we believe it's going to be very effective in educating uh, the Congress uh, members on the power and the capabilities of the important technologies uh, in optics. So thank you very much. Um, relative to the question, uh, increasing the amount of technology in the U.S. Can be, uh, that can be deployed into the mainstream applications requires really a broad portfolio, um, a broad R&D portfolio. Uh, it, it also requires um, mainstream um, uh, uh, talent and sufficient talent uh, that can investigate, develop, and prove out the technological uh, concepts. You know, funding research at academic institutions, startups, small and medium sized companies, large companies, national labs um, is essential to increasing the R&D portfolio. Um, we also, um, as was said in the opening remarks, um, we also must develop educational programs and training at all levels uh, to ensure that the talent to advance important technologies and translate these technologies into products that improve our security, our health, and our overall quality of life. So it distills down to um, a resource portfolio that's well-funded and uh, talent um, that's uh, educated and trained. That's a, uh, a, a great answer. And obviously you're in a position to, uh, 
to know what uh, what those uh, barriers are. Uh, I do have an email from uh, a participant from Connecticut. Um, how will Congress support optics development to position the United States as the leading country to commercialize optical based products? And obviously this caucus will work to show, I hope, how historical historic investments in light-based technologies have led to great benefits in society. Um, and that future investment is critical to ensuring that America leads innovation on the global stage once more. And what we know is in recent years, the amount of investment uh, by federal research in federal research and development has continued to decline. Um, we're at the lowest point since 1955, 56, as a percentage of investment, as a percentage of, of uh, GDP. Uh, and we're very concerned that global competitors are beginning to invest far more as a percentage of GDP than the United States is. So I'm hopeful that this caucus and the conversation, not only about what we've done to date, but what the what promise the future holds uh, will help uh, encourage members of Congress to uh, continue to invest more and more in this space and uh, wanna make sure that they continue to invest in innovation generally, but, but more narrowly uh, in optics and uh, in photonics. So uh, we have another uh, question, and Ed, Ed, feel free to jump in on this uh, from Massachusetts. How will Congress support and focus on small tech businesses for high growth markets such as the new space economy? And obviously, you know, I, I just uh, answer as I did the previous question. We want to see our local communities succeed. So businesses large and small, broad federal investment in R&D can lead the way to a major shift in our nation's innovation capabilities but targeted efforts are uh, key as well. And I don't know, Ed, if you wanted to add anything or any of the other well, panelists want to add anything on this. I, I would answer it in a very uh, similar way, uh, Congressman Morelli. Uh, new space is a great example of an area where optics and photonics technologies can play a, you know, a large and important role. Uh, you know, Companies of all sizes can contribute uh, to the space ambitions of the government and private companies through imaging, uh, positioning, communication, computation and measurement. In fact, private in interest uh, into space can provide a great boost to in market for optics and photonics technologies. So um, this is a really exciting area where I, you know, uh, uh, companies and small and large can play a large role. And I hate to call on anybody, but I, I wonder, Director Edcliffe, if you have any uh, additional thoughts on this uh, as well in terms of the, the size of companies and how we make sure everyone participates in the space. Yeah, I think you and Ed hit on it, right? That we have to have a coordinated approach on investment, starting with that early research. Um, and then we have to move into applied technology, you know, helping to bridge across from the art of possible into the art of practical. Um, we have to have that investment in manufacturing scale up in this country with that coordinated effort on workforce that we talked about. And then we have to help create the aggregated demand signal for how this technology can be used so that our investors here in the United States will invest in our com com companies and, you know, to help advance them and preserve and protect them for our use. Very good. And I don't know if doctors uh, Tromberg or Vote have anything additional you want to say in this space or just generally? Sure. Uh, I, I think, this is really the backbone of the whole innovation entrepreneurial structure in the biomedical engineering and uh, community, which we really drew upon uh, to be able to accomplish the, the RADx initiative. So we've not only uh, been able to support and sustain and, and grow that, uh, we've been able to take concepts all the way to manufacturing expansion, which is something that NIH typically has not done, but we've done this in record time to meet an urgent national need. So I think at the foundation, if we don't have those small systems, innovation, entrepreneurial systems, we'll never be able to exercise our muscle uh, to be able to solve really hard, complex problems quickly. Great. Um, Ed, uh, here's a question from uh, Virginia. As a whole community in optics and photonics, where do you see all optical trans transistor-based processors in two to three decades? And, and probably if you can answer this question, about what happens in two or three decades, you might be in the wrong business. <laughs> Give it a shot. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that question is asking, do I see all optical central processors um, in the next 20 to 30 years? And As opposed to simply integrated with some electronic piece right. or an integrated circuit. Yeah. Yes. 
And um, uh, you're right, if I could predict the future like this, um, I would probably, I'd probably be in the wrong job. Um, and it's a difficult uh, to, to make a, a really accurate prediction, but we can kind of use the recent past to kind of look forward to, uh, towards the future. You know, the, the, uh, the, the field I work in is integrated photonics and the organization that I work for is uh, AIM Photonics. And many of you know that integrated photonics uses semiconductor fabrication pro uh, and packaging processes to produce um, photonic integrated circuits. This means we get the benefits of semiconductor fabrication. Um, uh, you know, it, we get the benefits of uh, semiconductor fabrication in the uh, optics and photonics um, uh, fields. You know, in the last five years, uh, integrated photonics has come so far and um, is much more accessible to research and product developers. AIM Photonics, along with a few other companies and institutes, really have played a key role in increasing accessibility of this uh, technology. So improved accessibility at affordable prices has and will continue to propel advances in central processing design and efficiency. And it seems like it's a safe bet, although don't take my word and take it to the bank, um, but it seems like it's a safe bet to look forward to having all optical processors uh, in 20 to 30 years. I mean, we're accelerating the technology, we're moving faster. And um, as we continue to invest in these technologies, um, uh, we're, we're gonna make progress. And um, uh, otherwise, if we don't, we could find ourselves as customers to other countries. And we certainly wanna be in the lead in this area. So I'm just making a note of what you said just uh, 20 or 30 years from now, I'll come back to it. <laughs> yeah, um, we'll come back and have coffee and talk about it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we will indeed. So <laughs> this question was uh, directed to me, but I'm gonna punt on it. Are we adequately anticipating our workforce needs for this industry? I'm gonna call on, if I can, uh, Dr. Uh, Vote and also uh, uh, Director Radcliffe and, and certainly uh, Dr. Tromberg and Ed, if you have uh, comments to uh, make to it as well, but are we adequately anticipating our workforce needs in this industry? Sure, I, I would start by saying that in just in our area of Rochester, New York region, we're looking at a need for 550 optics technicians every single year. And we certainly can't support that ourselves. That's just in the small Finger Lakes region of New York. That does not include across the entire country and even around the world. But we need thousands of jobs every single year in this industry because it's the industry that's driving our future and it's the direction that we're heading to. This is how we're revolutionizing our world. But if we don't have the staff, the workforce to do the work of the technician, so the technician by definition is the person who uses their hands to manufacture, to test all of the products and all of the innovation. It's the person who typically has the bachelor's, the master's or the PhD who sits in front of the computer and is innovating for the future. If we don't have technicians, then the people who are des designated to be the innovators have to do the work of the technician. This is where we really far behind, fall behind in other countries. So this need in our nation is tremendous to have more technicians. And it comes down to things like protecting our national security. Very good. Director uh, Radcliffe? Yeah, I agree with Alexis. I think we, are, we have a good handle and are starting to define better that the requirements, the demand side signal of what we need in terms of workforce, whether it's precision optics technicians or some of the other more traditional based skilled technicians like CNC five axis. What we don't have a good handle on is how do we close the gap between the erosion of that workforce development pipeline over decades of not valuing manufacturing in this country. And we have to rethink how we're going to close that gap and, and accelerate training programs, compress their, their time scales so that we um, can flush them out quicker for industry. We also have to expand our recruitment pipeline. We have a whole generation here that has an opportunity to, to get interested in manufacturing and exciting uh, efforts like precision optics and, and photonics. We have to be able to recruit those people into this sector versus letting them go to other sectors. Um, we have some work on our hands, but I think that um, we understand that demand signal and now we can work backwards into that solution space with people like Monroe. That's great. Uh, Dr. Tromberg, did you have anything to add on that uh, question? I, I think the answers were right on, spot on target. And um, we, there are just tremendous opportunities and big need. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I got this in, this selected this question just because it's about quantum. And I always like to ask you questions about it since 
I, you know, in, in, in another life, I was a physicist, just not in this life. <laughs> um, but what role does uh, optics and photonics play in the emerging technology areas such as uh, quantum? And again, feel free others to uh, join in. Well, um, optics and photonics technologies are really important um, to many emerging technologies. Um, in some cases, optics and photonics technologies are the enabling technology. In other cases, they're the primary technology. You know, regardless of the role, enabling or primary, optics and photonics are crucial in, in, in the field of quantum or quantum information science, which includes quantum computing, quantum sensing, quantum communications. Optics and photonics is both an enabling and a primary technology. For example, quantum computing, you know, there are a, a few ways to build a quantum computer um, and people are doing it in, and companies are doing it in the US. We can build a quantum computer that's photon based. We can use trapped ions. We can go superconducting. And those are just three approaches that are uh, aggressively being pursued today. Um, all of these approaches use optics and photonics. For the photon-based um, computers, optics and photonics technologies are paramount by providing the qubits for the, com uh, for the computer, much like how transistors are the basis of a typical computer now. For trapped ion computers, lasers and modulators are the workhorses, with lasers providing the means to induce you know, qubit coupling. For superconducting computers, optics and photonics provides the means for input and output to the cryogenic environment that these computers um, operate in. So quantum, and one other point, quantum communications um, is an emerging field in which optics and photonics is without a doubt the primary technology. So optics and photonics technologies play a role in quantum information science in a very large way. And whether it's computing, communications, or sensing, um, this is the technology that's uh, very important. Uh, and I'm certainly happy to ask if the, any panelists want to add to uh, to that. Um, I would I would just add that in in the biomedical area, which, uh, as you know, um, healthcare is about twenty percent of the GDP and. These are, it, it really is a tremendous communication and informatics problem. Um, and uh, these advances will play a critical role in helping introduce um, efficiencies and um, accelerate knowledge that will save lives and help patients. Um, yeah. it's, it's a long haul, but it's important for us to be involved in this as soon as possible. And I suspect that 20% of GDP number is only scheduled to rise as uh, people in uh, the baby boomer generation, the significant numbers uh, begin to age into uh, uh, not only early retirement, but as they, you know, as lifespan continues, that's gonna be a big cohort of the population. And they're, uh, as you get older, obviously, we know you use more uh, uh, of the healthcare dollars. So that's gonna become more and more important. Um, I do have a question from Florida. How can undergraduate and graduate students get involved with promoting our advancements at an academic level to Congress? Again, uh, you know, from my perspective, engagement with your members, um, I often find when we're talking about some of these spaces and some of these technological advances that members of Congress, because they're dealing with so many different issues, uh, really don't have a current understanding of what's going on in this space. So I would just encourage people to engage, contact uh, your member of Congress in their district offices, uh, certainly talk to the staff because the staff really helps uh, I think distill down what the agenda is gonna be and what things uh, members of Congress need to really pay attention to. So that would be uh, really important. Um, I had a question from Montana. I'm, so, I'm sorry that Senator Daines uh, isn't uh, with us. I'm sure he'd wanna answer, but what photonics technologies do you consider strategic with international competition? So again, uh, not just as it relates to Montana, but across the country, what photonics technologies do you consider strategic with international uh, competition? Uh, Ed, do you wanna? Take a first whack at that. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, one of the ways to um, to look at this uh, question is um, to look at uh, a committee, a government committee called uh, CFIUS. CFIUS is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, and uh, the U.S. government defines critical technologies uh, as areas um, as technologies controlled uh, through U.S. export. Um, so many of these technology areas are photonic technologies, or at least enabled by 
photonic technologies. You know, some of the ex uh, examples of photonic technologies that are considered critical by the U.S. government include a wide array of lasers, including those used for industrial manufacturing as and directed energy weapons. Um, also sensing technology, including infrared sensors um, used for night vision technology and sensing instruments used in space. You know, many photonic materials are also seen as critical. Um, you know, the new materials that are coming out for modulators in um, integrated photonics, um, although we're early on and they haven't been necessarily designated, but um, those are critical uh, materials. Um, as new technologies emerge, there will likely be additions to the list of uh, critical technologies as, as defined by the U.S. government. But this list can be used as a proxy for strategic technologies that we want to always be in a leadership role on, we being the U.S. Any panelists want to uh, add any thoughts to that question? Let me, uh, let me, it, it, uh, there's a question from New York, which is similar to it in the sense that it asks, do you see the United States as the current leader in this technology area of photonics and optics? What countries are our biggest competitors? And again, uh, uh, Ed, if you want to start, but I'd, I'd be happy to hear from everyone on what uh, they see as the current leaders and, and whether we're a current leader and who the uh, competitors are in this space. Um, well, the U.S. is leading in many optics and photonics technologies um, that are important to national security and economic growth, for sure. Um, but not every important technology. While time passes, other parts of the world are catching up uh, and they're catching up quickly. Um, and, um, uh, and they might be behind now, but they're, but they're gaining. Um, and they're gaining on the U.S. Um, for example, in the area of high intensity lasers, um, the U.S. has been a global leader in this technology for decades. But recent investments by countries in Europe and in China, combined with an aging infrastructure um, in the U.S., opens the door for U.S. to lose that lead if we don't act. And in important technologies where the U.S. is losing ground or not leading, investments in R&D need to be increased. So collaboration between government and industry, academic organizations, and public-private partnerships um, can be encouraged as a way to maintain and improve our position uh, as, a, as a global leader. Um, you know, there are, there's a lot of research, a lot of development, a lot of progress made outside of the U.S., and we've got to run hard and fast um, to stay ahead in the race. So it's not only where we are, obviously, but it's the trajectory of where we're going. How, in terms of the the biospace, uh, Dr. Tromberg, how do we how do we stack up uh, relative to other countries there, and where is our competition? Well, I think it it follows the same general pattern, and and actually you've alluded to this in in terms of the fraction that we spend of GDP uh, on on research and. Other countries have really noted our remarkable success and imitated what we used to do and um, have created national initiatives. And of course, structures in other countries are more top down. So there are a number of biophotonics initiatives that have been led by several other countries around the world. Um, we haven't really put together. I mean, we have our national photonics initiative, which is spectacular and a caucus. And uh, hopefully this can be uh, a driver to create uh, a more integrated and intensive uh, approach for funding of these essential technologies. And uh, I would be curious, uh, uh, Director Radcliffe, do you have a, a perspective in terms of in, uh, in the national security space, how we rank and where we where we are relative to that? Yeah, not necessarily in a one through end priority, but I was going to build off of Ed's comment about accessibility and adoption, which you need both of those to help create a strong, healthy ecosystem in any country if you want to lead. If you look at the adoption side of where um, integrated photonics and op precision optics can, you know, are being adopted, the industry 4.0 sector, the United States small and medium manufacturers largely are lagging behind other countries that have a strong manufacturing focus. And that strikes at the heart of global competitiveness and strategic need. If we want to remain at the forefront of a strong manufacturing industrial base, helping our small and medium manufacturers be begin to adopt Industry 4.0, which utilizes now these sensors and capabilities of photonics and integrated photonics and precision optics, would help helps to maintain our eco vibrant ecosystem here. 
Um, and, and Congressman Raleigh, if I could add just one additional um, uh, uh, point is that um, if we look across the US, um, we, we really are fortunate to have, you know, a significant base of companies that produce the lens systems, the uh, prism systems, the precision assembly systems that enable great technology to be developed, great new products to be launched. And we want to continue to keep on looking at those in addition to the emerging technology. So, um, you know, we couldn't be as successful as a country as we are without the uh, technologies that uh, exist uh, today and are the workhorses um, for a lot of the things we do. You know, behind me is um, the a Mars rover. It's not the it's not the current one, but it's Curiosity. But uh, you know, Kodak had uh, imagers on that rover, and I heard you say in your introduction that um, there is at least one company from Rochester that has lenses um, that are enabling the the uh, the imaging systems on on the current rover. So I just wanted to put in a pitch for the uh, current technologies that exist today, because clearly we couldn't we couldn't survive without them. Yeah, no question. Um, there's also a question uh, from Massachusetts. What was is the importance of having government representation from four leading photonics industry regions and states when putting together the leadership of this caucus? We thought it was really important. Um, if you're going to have people out um, who are disciples of this, the best place to go is where there is already an active, uh, successful uh, cluster. And so we are able to give testimony to our colleagues about the importance of this uh, space in our local regions. And that's why it was so important. So, um, and it was kind of a natural in some respects. I mean, uh, Representative Mast uh, in Florida, there's significant uh, optics and, uh, and photonics uh, cluster, certainly in Arizona. Uh, and uh, uh, while I'm uh, sorry that Senator Sinema wasn't here to be able to give testimony to it, she's clearly excited about it and talked to, about it in her comments and um, Senator uh, Danes as well, who said people might not um, appreciate uh, and or think of Montana as as a hotbed of innovation, but they certainly are in this space. So we thought there's nothing that um, uh, would work better than to have those of us who are already uh, experiencing the growth in the sector um, to be able to uh, to do that and to uh, really get a uh, get a, a you know a way to get our staffs and people working together to try to promote this among other members. Um, and with that, as is often the case in the United States House of Representatives, all of a sudden a vote will pop up that you uh, need to stop everything else that you're doing and uh, get to the floor. And uh, as uh, as fate would have it, uh, that's exactly what's happened here. But um, so let me uh, again thank uh, our panelists. I'm really so excited. Uh, I think I hope this was informative uh, to people, and you've all had a chance to see now people who are experts in the field and really can talk about the importance of continuing to invest in this. So I do want to thank. Uh, Dr. Bruce Tromberg from NBIB, uh, NIBIB. Do you call it NIBIB or something? Is there a, a way to say that acronym or do you do the initials? I don't know. Government is always interesting for acronyms. I, I usually say the Engineering Institute at NIH. Okay, I'm not <laughs> sure that's a whole lot better, but okay. I'm gonna, I, may, uh, <laughs> I may copy that. But, but doctor, uh, thank you so much for what you do. Uh, Dr. Vo, thank you for all you do at MCC and and um, being out there as uh, someone really talking about workforce needs. And of course, uh, uh, Director Adele Radcliffe, who has been a leader in the space and continues to guard our economic and national security interests uh, in your work. So thank you. And of course, Ed White, thank you. Hopefully you won't be trapped in an airport uh, anytime soon with me trying to describe uh, quantum physics to me, but uh, you're a great friend and I appreciate your leadership in the space as well. And with that, I look forward to uh, hopefully a, a, a long, and continued engagement on this subject. And thank you all for being here. And thanks for everybody who joined us uh, this afternoon. Thank God you. Bless. Thank you. Bye-bye.